During the First World War, Britain's railways came under government control. After that conflict, nationalisation was proposed, but proved to be unachievable. So instead, the Railways Act of 1921 was passed, which grouped the railways in 1923 into four large companies. The Great Western, the Southern, the London Midland and Scottish, and the London and North Eastern. In this series, we'll take a look at each of these companies, their engineers, policies and innovations that they brought, as well as what remains of them in the preservation era. This is the Big Four at 100. Our final railway is the London and North Eastern, with a route mileage of 6,700. Created from seven constituents and 26 subsidiaries, it, like the LMS, had constituents in both England and Scotland, from East Anglia to the northeast of Scotland. In England, the LNER's inheritance included the Colne Valley and Halstead, the Mid Suffolk, Hull and Barnsley, and the South Yorkshire Junction. In Scotland, the inheritance was smaller than the LMS and included the Edinburgh and Bathgate, the Forth and Clyde Junction, and the Kilsyth and Bonnie Bridge. At its southern end was the Great Northern, who drew up one of the largest railway bills at 327 miles. The section reached Peterborough in 1850, followed by King's Cross in 1853 to rival the LNWR. Since 1850, the company had been under the direction of Chairman Sir Edmund Bucket Denson. Under his leadership, the Great Northern expanded to Dunstable, Grimsby, Nottingham and established a workshop at Doncaster. Doncaster Works opened in 1853 on a 61 acre site and was affectionately known as the plant. A 61 acre carriage works was later added followed by a 32 acre extension in 1889. The Great Northern was also a partner in several joint railways serving Liverpool, Chester and Great Yarmouth. By 1900 it had the third largest network in the UK but surprisingly, no docks, unlike some of the other pre-grouping companies. In East Anglia, a series of lines had been opened since 1836, culminating in the creation of the Great Eastern in 1862. The company had a virtual monopoly in the area, stretching from its London terminus at Liverpool Street to the North Norfolk coast. Like the Great Northern, the Great Eastern was a partner in joint lines, serving Doncaster and York. Freight traffic was healthy from the docks in East London and Harwich, and a workshop was opened at Stratford, which ceased production in 1924. The company also had royal status, serving Wolverton in Norfolk, the nearest station to the royal estate at Sandringham. From Liverpool Street, the Great Eastern operated the most intense commuter service in the UK to North and East London to the extent that by 1912 1,230 movements took place at the terminus. In 1920 plans were in place to electrify the service at a cost of £3 million. However, the management team instead decided to improve the signalling and operations which helped to increase the service by 75% at a cost of only £85,000. This also helped to reduce a major bottleneck at Bishopgate, whilst engine docks helped to reduce turnaround times. Working timetables were calculated down to half minutes, and tight schedules required fast precision driving, earning it the nickname the Jazz Service. Away from the capital, the company had three main lines, to Norwich via Ipswich, Kings Lynn via Cambridge and Great Yarmouth via Beckles. Cross-country routes ran from Marks Tay to Shelford via Haverhill, Ely to Norwich via Thetford and through the Waveney Valley from Tivitshall to Beckles via Bungie. There were also several branches, including the Kelverdon and Tolsby, the Wisbeach and Upwell Tramway, with some substantial ones, to Mildenhall and Harwich. In the Midlands, the Great Central was born in 1899. Its first route, however, was that from Manchester to Sheffield, 
dating from 1837, which included the three-mile-long Woodhead Tunnel, completed in 1845. This resulted in the creation of the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway in 1847, which too was a partner in a joint railway. The Cheshire Lines Committee with the Midland opened in 1867. The Great Central's chairman was Sir Edward Watkin, who was also the chairman of the Metropolitan and South Eastern Railways. He had a vision to build a line from Manchester to Paris, which would involve the construction of the UK's last main line. Authorised in 1893, it ran 92 miles from Annesley to Marylebone via Nottingham and Rugby. Known as the London Extension, it was completed in 1899, with the MSLR renaming itself the Great Central. After the extension, the GCR expanded further into the East Midlands, building a marshalling yard at Wath for coal traffic. Services interconnected with other railways, which continued under the LNER, with ports at Grimsby and Immingham. In 1912, the two ports were connected by a tramway, using 500 volts DC. It had eight stops, reaching Immingham in 1913, with the spur added in 1914, and a depot and workshop built at Piewipe. The original 12 trams came from brush, and all were single-deckers, with 72 seats mounted on a bogey chassis. In 1945, three more trams arrived from Gateshead, with the tramway operating a 24-hour service, with one every 20 minutes during peak hours. To the north, the North Eastern Railway was created in 1854, centering on York. Similar to the Great Eastern, the North Eastern had a virtual monopoly, stretching from the East Riding through County Durham to Northumberland, with docks at Hull and Hartlepool. Engineered largely by Robert Stevenson, its southernmost point was at Selby. To the east was Whitby and Scarborough, to the north as far as berwick upon tweed with two cross-country routes to the west, reaching Carlisle via Hexham and Teabay via Stainmore. The North Eastern's main source of revenue was coal from numerous collieries. By the grouping, the company boasted the largest fleet of wagons, and in 1866 had designed the first of the UK's many 060 goods locomotives. Its workshop was at Darlington, opened in 1863 on a 27-acre site. Carriages and wagons came from York, opened in 1884, and Walkergate opened in 1902, supported by another wagon works at Shildon, having its origins with the Stockton and Darlington. The LNER's largest Scottish inheritance was the North British, formed in 1846. Initially running from Berwick to Edinburgh, the company expanded southwards to Carlisle and northwards to Dundee. Its crowning glory was the completion of the Royal Border Bridge at Berwick in 1850. These three main lines all radiated from Edinburgh, and the completion of the fourth bridge in 1890 allowed for faster journey times. It also gave greater access to the coal fields in Fife and Fish from Aberdeen. A fourth main line met the West Highlands Railway at Helensborough. With backing from the North British, the route reached Fort William in 1894, followed by an extension to Malague in 1901, with a complete takeover by the North British in 1908. The smallest constituent was the Great North of Scotland, with only 335 route miles. Formed in the same year as the North British, its main line was from Aberdeen to Inverness, with branches to Peterhead, Elgin and Lozymouth. Largely single track, the main passenger revenue was tourism, boosted by the station at Ballater, the nearest to the royal estate at Balmoral. Freight, meanwhile, consisted of fish, granite and whisky from Speyside. Like the Southern Railway, the LNER was split into three divisions, with the southern section covering the Great Northern, Great Eastern and Great Central. The North East covered the North Eastern and Hull and Barnsley, with the Scottish being the former North British and Great North of Scotland. 
The company's principal route was the East Coast Main Line from King's Cross to Edinburgh. Opened in stages, it was worked by the Great Northern, North Eastern and North British from 1854, with three services using joint stock. The LNER's first CME was Nigel Gresley, who started his railway career at the LNWR under Francis Webb. Becoming carriage and wagon superintendent at Horridge in 1898, he joined the Great Northern in 1905 as its chief carriage designer. Appointed CME in 1911 under the recommendation of Ivert, Gresley's first locomotive was the H1, later K1, in 1912. This was followed by the O1, later O3, in 1918, using his own setup with three cylinders and conjugated valve gear. This would set the pattern for all Gresley designs. One of his final for the Great Northern was the H3, later K3, with its huge boiler which laid down in motion a concept adopted by the LNER. Upon its creation, the LNER decided to use Pacifics for its expresses, whilst other railways still used 440s or 460s. At the time, the only Pacifics were the GWR's number 111, the Great Bear, and 5A2s, designed by Sir Vincent Raven for the North Eastern. An earlier design had been submitted in 1915 with four cylinders, but rejected because of the war. Two, however, did appear in 1922, classified A1 and being tested against the Raven A2s, proving to be the superior. The A1s used Gracely's three-cylinder and conjugated valve gear arrangement with drive to the centre axle. However, the coal consumption was very high, but any improvements were rejected by Gresley. In 1924, number 1472 Flying Scotsman was displayed at the British Empire Exhibition held at Wembley. Alongside was the Great Western's number 4073 Caffilly Castle, which claimed to be more powerful, so a series of trials was conducted in 1925. Despite being smaller, the castle was indeed more powerful and economical. This led to a rebuilding program with a higher boiler pressure, larger superheater and reduced cylinders. Classified A3, the new locomotive finally had changes to the valve gear, resulting in a coal saving of one and a half tonnes. The company's flagship service was the 10am train to Edinburgh, dating back to 1864. In 1927, the service was named the Flying Scotsman, and the following year it was made non-stop, using the A3s, with the first run taking place on the 1st of May. Its genius was the use of a corridor tender, allowing crews to change on the move. It is said that Gresley made the calculation using chairs in his dining room, working out the maximum width required without reducing the coal space and water tank. The train itself was the latest in style, with teak coaches hosting a hairdressing salon, cinema coach and ladies retiring room. The restaurant cars were in the Louis XIV style, with armchairs, whilst the cocktail bar served a Flying Scotsman cocktail. The train ran daily, and on the 30th of November 1934 was clocked at 100 miles per hour, the first official such recording in the UK. The following year, number 2750 Papyrus was clocked at 108 miles per hour, including a sustained speed of 100 miles per hour for 12 and three quarter miles. Although the Great Northern dominated proceedings, the LNER did inherit a strong fleet of locomotives, such as the D11 Directors and O4s from the Great Central. Despite his big engine policy, Gresley could turn his attention to smaller designs, such as the B-17s for expresses in East Anglia and the D-49s for secondary work in the North East and Scotland. For the West Highland line, he produced a tailored locomotive, the K-4s. The V-1s and V-3s were large passenger tanks, whilst the J-39 was a modern freight design for secondary duties. Taking inspiration from Europe and the USA, he also came up with some experimental ideas. One of these was a 464, 
with four cylinders and a 450 pounds PSI marine water tube boiler. Classified W1 and known as the Hush Hush, the locomotive only lasted a short while before being rebuilt. Another was the P2282 Mikado's, another tailored locomotive, this time for use between Edinburgh and Aberdeen. These featured a feed water heater, lens valve gear and a Carl Chap double blast pipe. In 1933, Gresley paid a visit to Germany to inspect a new diesel train, the Flying Hamburger. A proposal was made to purchase some units for use between King's Cross and Newcastle, but following Papyrus's record, steam proved to be equal to the new diesels. Returning to the UK, Gresley drew up plans for a new locomotive, based on the A3s, but with a larger boiler. This was housed in a streamlined casing, developed by car manufacturer Bugatti, with the steam passages also streamlined, an idea thought of by French engineer André Chapillon. The timing couldn't have been better. In 1935, King George V celebrated his Silver Jubilee, and to mark the occasion, the LNER introduced a new service to Newcastle using the new locomotive. On a press run, number 2509 Silver Link reached 112.5 miles per hour, the silver livery also attracting media attention. The locomotive was classified A4, with the service officially launched on the 30th of November and was the first streamlined train in the UK. Timed at four hours, it was also the fastest long-distance train. The following year saw the coronation of King George VI, and again the LNER launched a new train. Five more A4s were constructed for the service, all named on a coronation theme, as well as an all-new set of coaches. Named the coronation, it was longer than the Silver Jubilee, reaching Edinburgh in six hours. With a striking silver and blue livery, it rivalled a similar service on the LMS, who by now had caught up to the LNER under the guidance of William Stanier. The coronation was also supported by another new service, the West Riding Limited, to Leeds. But it wasn't all glamorous expresses. The LNER was also a large freight carrier. Whiskey came from the Highlands, fish from Humberside and East Anglia, with coal from the North East and Fife. In pre-grouping days, the Great Northern had not only been the carrier, but also the merchant of domestic coal, helping to reduce the price. Under the LNER, new marshalling yards appeared at Whitemore and Temple Mills, with the docks at Harwich, Grimsby and Middlesbrough expanded. Despite this, the company faced stiff road competition. One solution was an overnight Anglo-Scottish freight named the Green Arrow. The A4s were unsuitable and no A3s could be spared, so in 1936, Gresley drew up a mixed traffic design, again based on the A3s. It featured an unusual 262 wheel arrangement, which allowed for a wider firebox, coupled to a shortened A3 boiler, but with smaller driving wheels. Classified V2, the first five were trialled across the system, and proved to be very free steaming, and capable of handling any duties. The V2s did, however, have a high axle loading, which barred them from some areas such as East Anglia. Their real zenith, though, came during the war, with one being recorded hauling 26 coaches, and production continued until 1944. In the same year as the V2s launch, the LNER took full responsibility for the former Midland and Great Northern system. Running across Lincolnshire and Norfolk, from Little Bytham and Peterborough to Great Yarmouth, the MNGN had branches to Norwich, Cromer and Lowestoft. Formed in 1893 from several smaller companies, the MNGN was the only true rival to the Great Eastern. At 180 miles, it was also the largest joint network in the UK, with a workshop at Melton Constable. Passenger traffic consisted of locals, with holiday makers from the East Midlands in the summer, whilst freight was largely agricultural. Despite its size, the MNGN was mostly single track, 
and worked by both the LMS and the LNER after 1923 until the full takeover. But the LNER's crowning glory came on the 3rd of July 1938. 1A4, number 4468 Mallard, was fitted with a Calchap double blast pipe and during a test run reached 126 miles per hour, a record for steam traction which still stands today. With war looming, the government set up the Railway Executive Committee to coordinate operations within the Big Four. Its first chairman was Sir Ralph Wedgwood, who, before his appointment, was the LNER's Chief General Manager. A unique operation during the conflict was the use of armoured trains along the East Coast and in Scotland, manned by members of the Polish Army. In East Anglia and Lincolnshire, once rural areas, freight traffic increased, with the setting up of air bases for the RAF and the United States Army Air Force. In 1941, Gresley suddenly died from a heart attack and was replaced by Edward Thompson. He disliked his predecessor's conjugated valve gear and brought in radical changes, but his plan for a wartime Pacific was delayed by wartime constraints. Thompson started his railway career on the Northeastern, moving to the Great Northern in 1912 as carriage and wagon superintendent. His last appointment before becoming CME was works manager at Stratford in 1930. One of Thompson's changes was to bring in a standardisation plan, already well established on the GWR and LMS. This would mainly focus on secondary lines still worked by pre-grouping locomotives. His first class was the B1, which had to be designed around existing patterns due to the constraints, with the boiler coming from the B17s. The first appeared in 1942, but production of the first batch wasn't completed until 1944. The B1s worked across the whole of the LNER system, with those based at Top Shed hauling suburban turns to Cambridge from King's Cross. On the Great Eastern, they ran to Norwich and on secondary lines, as intended, with the North Eastern examples replacing the D49s. In Scotland, they could be found between Edinburgh and Aberdeen, on the Waverley route to Carlisle and in the West Highlands. Eventually, Thompson got his Pacific in 1945, when he rebuilt A1, number 4470 Great Northern, classified A1-1. stroke He fitted three sets of valve gear, with the rods the same length, resulting in the outside cylinders being set well back. The next Pacifics were six rebuilt from V2s, the A21s, with the P2 rebuilds being A22s. The next class was entirely new, the A23s, but based upon the rebuilds. The rebuilding program continued to secondary classes. The B-16s, for example, some of which had already been rebuilt by Gresley, had Walshirts valve gear fitted. The B-17s, meanwhile, had some fitted with B-1 boilers, becoming the B-2s. One legacy, however, was the use of steel-bodied coaches instead of Teak, the forerunner to the BR Mark 1s. Thompson's reign didn't last long and was replaced by Arthur Peppercorn in 1946. Born in 1889, Peppercorn started at Doncaster and used the best ideas from Gresley and Thompson to create a series of economical but more powerful locomotives. His first was the A2 in 1947, based on the Thompson rebuilds with three separate cylinders. However, the centre one drove the leading axle, with the two outside driving the centre axle. This idea came from the Thompson school of thought, but led to a much neater and tidier front end. From Gresley, Peppercorn incorporated a banjo dome and V-fronted cab, but only two would appear before nationalisation. The A2s had single chimneys, but five did receive doubles later on. Although found along the East Coast Main Line, the class is best known for their work between Edinburgh and Aberdeen, where their ample power was ideal for the steep gradients and switchback nature. His next class was the A1, which was a development of Great Northern. 
it said that Doncaster delayed production, allowing Peppercorn to make alterations, and again he used ideas from his predecessors. Gresley's influence was similar to the A2s, with both classes sharing common components, although the A1's driving wheels were 6 inches smaller. From Thompson came the steam circuit and large firebox to deal with the poor quality coal at that time. All came from British Railways and in the Elliniard tradition were allocated along the East Coast Main Line with a further allocation at Leeds. Recording some of the highest mileages, their only fault was the front bogey, which came from the B1s. This did cause some rough riding, but was altered later on. Peppercorn's final design was also the LNER's last, the K1s. Like the Pacifics, they continued on from a Thompson rebuild. In this case, K4, number 3445, McKaylin Moore in 1945. Further rebuilding was declined, so once again Peppercorn adopted the idea, but with modifications. The redesign featured a new running plate at the front, pony truck and larger tenders. The whole class came from the North British Locomotive Company under BR between 1949 and 1950. Similar to the B1s, the K1s could be found across the whole of the LNER system. On the Great Eastern, they handled freights from March, with the North Eastern batch used on light duties. This included branches around Wensleydale and Weardale, but they could also handle heavier trains on the main line, whilst those in Scotland could be found in the West Highlands, alongside the K4s and B1s. In preservation, the LNER is unique in that all the locomotives came from either a constituent company or BR, the exception being B1 number 61264. All the major constituents are represented, with the bulk of the LNER itself coming from Gresley, with two each from Thompson and Peppercorn. From the Great Northern are two Ivert Atlantics, C1 number 251 and C2 number 990 Henry Oakley. In 1953, both hauled the Doncaster Centenarian, with number 251 later being displayed at York. Henry Oakley, meanwhile, was steamed again in 1975 for the Rail 150 celebrations at Shildon and had a brief spell on the Keithley and Worth Valley. A pioneer in preservation was J52 number 68846, the first locomotive to be purchased privately from BR when she was acquired by Captain Bill Smith in 1959. Based at Hatfield and used on rail tours, she was based on the North Yorkshire Moors from 1974 to 1980. Donated to the National Railway Museum, she visited the USA for the Sacramento Rail Fair in California during 1991. Touring other railways, she is now on display at York in her Great Northern livery. Another tank engine is N2 No. 69523 owned by the Gracely Society since 1963. Stored at Harworth Colliery near Doncaster, she first went to the Keithley and Worth Valley, moving to the Great Central in 1975. Remaining there until 2017, she's now based at the North Norfolk. The Great Eastern has seven examples, including the last 240 in the UK, E4 number 62785. Another is Ofro Saddle Tank number 229, which survived after being sold to Beakley Docks at Chepstow in 1917, working until the 1960s, but wasn't officially preserved until 1982. N7 number 69621 was the last locomotive outshot from Stratford in 1924. Restored at Chapel in Essex between 1981 and 1989, she hauled shuttles to Mark's Tay in 1991. Loaned to the North Norfolk until 2015, she has since returned to Chapel. The North Norfolk is home to B12 number 61572, the only inside cylinder 460 in the UK. Purchased by the Midland and Great Northern Joint Railway Society with J15 number 65462, she was withdrawn in 1961. Famously working the Wandering 1500 Rail Tour in 1963, number 61572 arrived at the NNR 
with the J-15 in 1967. Restoration was slow and was eventually completed in Germany in 1994. Now the railway's flagship, she has visited a number of railways, including the last steam on the Met in 2000. The North Norfolk runs for five miles from Sheringham to Holt, along the former MNGN line from Norwich City to Cromer via Melton Constable. It survived the MNGN's mass closure in 1959, finally going in 1964. Opened in 1975, Holt was reached in 1989, where the former station building from Stalham has been rebuilt. A mainline connection at Sheringham was made in 2010, and the railway now operates dining trains to Cromer in the summer. In 2013, an engineering facility was acquired from Chatham. Relocated to Weybourne, the facility carries out contract and in-house work. Coaching stock, meanwhile, includes a vintage train, the sole surviving quad art set, and a rake of suburban Mark 1s, their BR equivalent. The Great Central only has two locomotives, one passenger and one freight. The passenger example is D11 number 506 Butler Henderson, designed for expresses on the London extension. With drawn in 1960, Butler Henderson was displayed at Clapham and ran on the preserved Great Central from 1982 to 1992. She's now on display at Barrow Hill. Freight classes are represented by 04 number 63601. Classified 8K by the GCR, they were selected as a War Department standard during the First World War. In 1923, the class became the largest inheritance by the LNER, but several were sold on, including 13 to J and A Brown in New South Wales, where three survive. Number 63601, however, was not one of those sent to France, and were drawn in 1960. Kept at Dinting from 1976 to 1996, she returned to steam in 2000 at the Great Central, following a steam railway appeal. The present-day GCR, from Loughborough to Leicester, was once part of the London Extension. One of the last sections to close in 1969, it was reopened by the Mainline Steam Trust in 1973. The railway is the only double-track heritage line in the UK, offering a real mainline experience, although the section from Rothley to Leicester is still single. Currently, the GCR is busy working on a connection with the other Great Central at Ruddington, making for an 18-mile route. Unlike most railways, the North Eastern is largely represented by freight classes, with nine locomotives, only three of which are passenger types. In 1967, the North Eastern Locomotive Preservation Group was formed, who acquired J72, number 65894, and Q6, number 63395, the last pre-grouping classes working on BR. They also own J72, number 69023, built in 1951 to a design dating from 1898. The North Yorkshire Moors once ran from Whitby to Rillington Junction on the line from Scarborough to York. It was engineered by George Stevenson and features a steep 1 in 49 gradient at Beck Hole and reopened in 1973. This requires the NYMR to employ a big engine policy. As well as Nelpeg, the A4 Preservation Society are based here along with the LNER Carriage Association who own vehicles from both Gresley and Thompson. The railway is well known for its appearance in the TV series Heartbeat. Since 2007, it has run regular trains to Whitby and Battersby so frequently that Network Rail constructed a second platform at Whitby. Recent additions have been the reinstallation of the roof at Pickering Station plus a carriage shed and the replacement of bridges at Beckhole and Gothland. In Scotland, two locomotives were selected by BR to make a quartet representing each of the major Scottish companies, with the other two being preserved by the LMS as seen in episode 3 of this series. The oldest of the two is North British D34 number 256 Glen Douglas from 1913 and withdrawn in 1959. 
Working until 1962, she moved to Bowness as part of a plan to restore her for the centenary of the West Highland Line in 1994. This never materialised and Glenn Douglas is now on display at Glasgow Riverside. The youngest of the quartet is Great North of Scotland D40, number 49, Gordon Highlander, from 1920. Withdrawn in 1958, she was restored incorrectly in GNSOR Green, but at the time of her construction, black was being used. When Glasgow Riverside opened in 2011, Gordon Highlander swapped places with Glenn Douglas. Also from the North British and at Bowness is J36 number 673, one of 25 sent to France during World War I and named Maud. Working until 1966, she was purchased by the Scottish Railway Preservation Society and took part in the inaugural Jacobite series in 1984. From the Gresley era is K4 number 3442 The Great Marquess, acquired by Lord Lindsay in 1963, who restored her into her LNER livery. Working rail tours across BR until 1967, she moved to the Severn Valley and returned to the West Highlands in 1989. Sold to John Cameron in 2003, the Great Marquess was retired in 2015. The Jacobite series runs from Fort William to Malague, and now operated by the West Coast Railway Company as a daily service throughout the summer from April to October. Renowned for its scenery and the famous Glenfinnan Viaduct, LNER motive power over the years has ranged from Maud and the K4 to K1 number 62005 and B1 number 61264. Number 61264 is the only LNER locomotive to be rescued from Barry Scrapyard, having ended her days as a stationary boiler at Colwick. Leaving in 1976 for the Great Central, the restoration included a new firebox and boiler barrel before returning to traffic in 1997. Mainline registered in 1998, number 61264 is a much-travelled engine, ranging from the West Highlands to East Anglia, where she was first allocated to Harwich Parkston Quay, and has had two periods of operation. A second B1, number 61306, was one of the last three in service, being withdrawn in 1967. Stored at Carnforth, she was named Mayflower, a name previously carried by sister number 61379. Moved to the Great Central and the Neen Valley, Mayflower was sold to Jeremy Hoskins in 2020. In 1928, the LNER set up a railway museum in York to house a collection of locomotives from its constituents, with more added from other railways later on. In 1960, the British Transport Commission drew up a list of historic items of rolling stock from each of the pre-grouping companies, the Big Four and BR. Further museums opened at Clapham, Swindon and Leicester, but in 1975, York was relocated into the Old North Depot to become the National Railway Museum. Not everything could be housed at York, so some items were loaned out to other railways, a tradition that continues today. The Old Goods Shed became the Peter Allen Building, housing carriages and wagons in a station setting. The Great Hall, meanwhile, was renovated in 1990, and a new museum, Locomotion, opened at Shildon in 2004. The collection continues to expand, with some items from abroad, including a Chinese KF-7 and a Japanese bullet train. A more recent addition has been HST number 43002, whilst the last Class 66, number 66779 Evening Star, will be added upon its withdrawal after around 40 years of service. One of the LNER locomotives in the collection is the first V2, number 4771 Green Arrow. After being kept in storage at Doncaster, Hellifield and Preston Park near Brighton, Green Arrow was restored at Norwich in 1972, performing the first steam run over the Settle and Carlisle in 1978. Running throughout the country, Green Arrow was withdrawn in 2008 after sustaining a cracked monoblock. Displayed at York and Shildon, she moved to the Danham Gallery in Doncaster 
alongside C1 number 251, which opened in 2021. A natural candidate for preservation was A4 number 60007, the 100th Gresley Pacific, and named after her designer. In 1959, number 60007 took the post-war speed record at 112.5 miles per hour, ending her career on the three-hour Glasgow to Aberdeen Expresses in 1966. Acquired by the A4 Preservation Society and restored at Crewe using parts from sister number 60026 Miles Beaver, Sir Nigel Gresley has been a mainline regular since 1977. Based on the North Yorkshire Moors since 1995, she underwent an overhaul at the NRM between 2015 and 2022. Number 60009 Union of South Africa is one of the Coronation series, being owned by John Cameron since withdrawal in 1966. First based on the Lochte Private Railway, Number 9 marked the centenary of the Fourth Bridge in 1990 but was permanently retired in 2022. On the list, drawn up by the BTC in 1960, was record holder number 4468 Mallard, who first went to Clapham, followed by York, in 1975. To mark 50 years since her record, Mallard was restored in 1986, but hasn't worked since the anniversary in 1988. A fourth A4, number 60019 Bitten, is something of a Cinderella. Having been kept at various sites, she finally returned to steam in 2007. Two others are in North America, number 60008 Dwight D. Eisenhower at the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay, and number 60010 Dominion of Canada at the Canadian Railway Museum in Montreal. The most famous Gresley locomotive, though, has to be A3 number 4472 Flying Scotsman. Purchased by Alan Pegler in 1963, she was restored at Doncaster and worked rail tours all over the country, even after BR steam ban. This was due to a contract between Pegler and BR, with Flying Scotsman even having two tenders for a short while. A tour of the USA took place between 1969 and 1973, but after going bankrupt, Alan Pegler sold Scotsman to William McAlpine. Based at Carnforth, number 4472 visited Australia in 1988, breaking the non-stop record for steam at 422 miles. Later sold again to Tony Marchington, Flying Scotsman was purchased by the NRM for £2.3 million in 2004. A major overhaul then ensued, costing £4.5 million, being restored into her BR configuration, with double chimney and smoke deflectors. Now under the care of Ian Riley, Scotsman continues to tour the country on both the mainline and heritage circuit. The only peppercorn Pacific to make it into preservation was A2 number 60532 Blue Peter, who worked in Scotland from 1949 to 66. Acquired by Jeff Drury in 1968, she's been associated with the BBC's children's programme of the same name ever since. First based at Dinting, Blue Peter was loaned to Nelpeg in 1987. Whilst on a rail tour in 1994, a violent wheel slip at Durham destroyed the valve gear. Returning in 1996, Blue Peter was withdrawn in 2002, being displayed at Darlington and Barrow Hill. Sold to Jeremy Hoskins in 2014, she's now based at Crewe. With no A1s making it into preservation, a project was launched in 1990 to build a brand new example. Numbered 60163 and named Tornado, the frames were cut in 1994, with the boiler constructed in Germany and the whole project completed in 2008, making Tornado the first all-new standard gauge steam locomotive in the UK since Evening Star in 1960. Run in at the Great Central, Tornado has made numerous film and TV appearances, from Top Gear to Paddington. Another first came in 2017, when she was recorded at 100 miles per hour on a test run, the first steam locomotive to do so since 1967. Even before Tornado was completed, 
other new build projects have been started, with classes from each of the Big Four and BR. Diesel preservation has also benefited, with the Ivert Diesel Recreation Society and the Class 29 Baby Deltic projects. We enter this programme with Union of South Africa arriving at York with the Scarborough Spar Express, and be sure to take a look at the other episodes in this series.